Good morning. I'm joined by Eric Lawson from Atlas Machine. Good morning. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Secretary. It's an honor. Okay. Wanted to talk to you. What is Atlas Machine? Who are they? Well, Atlas Machine is a, a unique company that I'm proud to represent. Uh, we provide responsive solutions to industry uh, using the skills of our people. We, through our industrial machining solutions or our compressed air solutions, are a lifeline to industry when they are down, when things are broke, uh, when they are not producing their goods or services, we are brought in to help them get their operations back in full effect, producing the goods and services that you and I use on a daily basis. All right. Know that they've been around for 100 years or over 100 years? Over 100 close. years. Uh, started out um, very early, uh, 1907, as an elevator repair company in downtown Louisville. Uh, and through the years uh, have grown into what we are today, family-owned company, mm -hmm. uh, fourth-generation owned company. Okay. Rich Gimmel. Rich Gimmel is uh, our proud owner, right. uh, very proud of his business, very proud of his people. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about what you do. I know that you're a compliance person. What does a compliance person mean? What is that? That's this big, long, fancy word, but what does it mean? Uh, compliance uh, director is really a fancy term for I manage risk for the company. Okay. Uh, various aspects of risk for the company, uh, but one that I love the most, one that's closest to my heart is workplace safety. Okay. You know, an interesting part about that, when I say this fancy word, in a, in a past life as a athletic administrator, when they said compliance was coming in, everybody got nervous. Everybody got afraid. One of the things, one of the things that we've been focusing on since I've been at the helm of, of the labor cabinet is safety. Uh, one of the things that we're going to do, you know, during this term also, is we're, we're not going to be heavy-handed when it comes to compliance. What we're going to do is we're going to educate, we're going to educate, we're going to educate, and then side tape. Now, since taking over at Atlas, what have you done to educate these folks uh, so that you have a safe environment? Well, looking back at our trends, we looked back many years, looked at our injury and illness trends, mm -hmm. and found that we were doing some things really well. Mm -hmm. Workplace safety regulations, mm -hmm. check. Mm -hmm. Compliance training, check. We were doing those things really, really well. But due to the unique nature of our business, mm -hmm. what we didn't do well was uh, how do we respond to those unplanned hazards. Mm -hmm. We can plan all day long, mm -hmm. but due to the uniqueness of our business, the type of work that we do, mm -hmm. unplanned hazards present themselves. And what we had to do is really step back and look, are we empowering our employees mm -hmm. when they are presented with this hazard to make that best decision possible? Mm -hmm. Our employees are faced with thousands upon thousands of decisions. And the decision that they make will either increase or decrease their risk of injury mm -hmm. from that hazard. Mm -hmm. So we reached out, we talked to our employees, we found out what are you facing, what are you seeing, what are you needing. Mm -hmm. And what we found is they have a voice. Mm -hmm. They have great ideas. But what we needed them to do was act. Mm -hmm. We needed them to act on that decision. We needed them to make that correct decision mm -hmm. each and every time. Mm -hmm. Because the consequences, mm -hmm. you hope they wouldn't be severe. Right but sometimes they were severe, and we wanted to avoid that. Mm -hmm. You know, and as I stated, my, my, my number one job as Secretary of Labor is to help ensure that as these young men and women uh, of the state of Kentucky, of the Commonwealth of Kentucky, as they go in in one piece and healthy, at 4.30, 5 o'clock, or whenever their shift ends, I want them to go out that same way. Now, one thing that was abundantly clear to me uh, at Atlas was that from the time we hit the front door, there's a safety culture there. You just felt it. Absolutely. And it was further evidenced by the reason that we were actually there was to give an award because you haven't had injuries in excess of over a million hours. Yes, sir. Very proud. People have missed time. So that is, is, is the thing that I got most there, that culture. Can you share how you've developed that? Talk about from the time you got there, what it was like to where we are today. Well, we really, again, looking back, we had to have our employees have a vested interest in this program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I could have came in, uh, found a safety program off the shelf, mm -hmm. paid thousands of dollars for this safety program, said this is going to be our safety program. Mm -hmm. I could have trained our employees to it. But if it did not fit the type of work we were doing, mm -hmm. if it was not customized, mm -hmm. and it was not um, 
taken on and driven by our employees, mm -hmm. it would not have been successful. Mm -hmm. So we really kind of stepped back. Mm -hmm. We scrapped the traditional compliance model, the mm -hmm. traditional safety compliance model. Uh, because quite frankly, especially when it came to unplanned hazards, mm -hmm. it wasn't working for us. Right. So we said, guys and gals, this is your program. Mm -hmm. This is not my program. I'm not just the safety guy. <laughs> right. We are all in this together. You have a vested interest in this. Mm -hmm. From the time you come here, we want you to go home the exact same way that you got here. Mm -hmm. And really bringing in and empowering those employees to be part of that safety program mm -hmm really was kind of the turning point for us. Mm -hmm. They took a personal commitment to it. Mm -hmm. That personal commitment to it by far outweighs anything that we could ever do from mm -hmm. a compliance standpoint. Right. We can follow all the workplace safety regulations in the world, mm -hmm. but if you look today, lockout tagout has mm -hmm. been in place for years now. Mm -hmm. Federal and state ran OSHA, mm -hmm. uh, but we still have employees who failed to do lockout tagout right. and um, ultimately give the ultimate price for that, right, their lives. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so that commitment's not there. Mm -hmm. In those situations, that commitment's not mm -hmm. there. We focused, we honed in on that personal commitment, mm -hmm. that employee-driven, that mm -hmm. employee empowerment safety program. Okay. Now, what would you do, or what would your words of wisdom be to mid-sized, small companies uh, about safety and how you went about it and how they could get this injected into their workplace? First thing, it has to be employee driven. It mm -hmm. starts with the employee, it ends with the employee. Mm -hmm. If you take that employee out, mm -hmm. that safety program will not work. Mm -hmm. I cannot set up in my office and develop a safety program mm -hmm. that's going to be effective to our operations. Your employees have to be empowered, they have to be an active participant in that. The second thing is, uh, you do not have to reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are a lot of organizations and companies, the labor cabinet included, mm -hmm. that you can reach out to mm -hmm. for assistance. Mm -hmm. Other companies that have great safety programs and effective sa safety programs that would be more than happy mm -hmm. to assist you mm -hmm. in putting an effective safety program in, in uh, your operations. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, think outside the box. Uh, how about that? How about that? <laughs> Use a little common sense in your safety right. program. Once again, you could go online and you can buy your safety program straight off the shelf. You will spend thousands upon thousands of dollars mm -hmm. um, and be wasted money mm -hmm. because you had to develop a safety program that fits your operations, mm -hmm. that fits your employees, that fits the type of things and activities that you do. Mm -hmm. If you feel that you can simply buy your way out of safety, mm -hmm. you are wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, it is an active commitment from your management team. Mm -hmm and it's a level of empowerment to your employees mm -hmm. that makes that effective safety program. So step outside the box, mm -hmm. be creative. Right. The, the days of traditional safety compliance are gone. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we are doing more and more things mm -hmm. today than we did in the past. Right. We have greater technologies available to assist mm -hmm. uh, in, in safety from fall protection to right. lockout, tagout. There are companies that are making great things mm -hmm. to assist you in that but you have to customize it to your operations. Well, interesting, what I heard you say was this is not a one-size-fit-all. Absolutely and, not. Uh, you certainly can't buy it off the shelf. Tell us or tell our audience, uh, now that you've uh, gotten our awards for safety, how has that helped your insurance and how has it helped your morale? Because one of the things I noticed there uh, about this small family business is that people have worked there for a long time and also second and third generations. So there's something you guys have that's special going on over there that we want to share with all the small businesses, mid-sized businesses. Well, I'll start with the morale standpoint. Uh, we do have multiple generations of family members that work for us. Mm -hmm. uh, as a father myself, uh, I would feel more uncomfortable if my daughter uh, or one of my, my, one of my daughters or my son wanted to get into the type of work we do. Mm -hmm. I would feel comfortable bringing them to Atlas. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's where that morale comes in. I'm proud of our company mm -hmm. and our employees are proud of our company. Mm -hmm. But as any father, if I <laughs> felt that it was unsafe, that's right. I would not want my child there. Mm -hmm. And the generationals that you see uh, within our facility mm -hmm. uh, goes to show that the people before them felt that this was a safe mm -hmm. place to work for their mm -hmm. family members. Now on the second thing on the insurance costs, um, especially workers' comp insurance. 
-hmm. That's a bottom line cost. Right. You have to have workers' compensation insurance mm -hmm. before you're e even able to make the first part, mm -hmm. perform the first amount of work. That is a bottom line cost that right. all businesses have to incur. Mm -hmm. So how do we reduce that? What can we do to reduce that bottom line cost? Well, through our experience, through lowering those injury and illness rates, mm -hmm. um, it, became, it becomes apparent in our experience modification rating, or our EMR. Mm -hmm. And basically what that is, is a, it's a modification rating mm -hmm. based off your previous experience that will either increase mm -hmm. or decrease your workers' compensation insurance premiums. Mm -hmm. Fortunately for us, our previous year's experience, uh, we have significantly reduced that experience modification rating. Mm -hmm. uh, to the point, if you want to talk bottom line numbers, mm -hmm. just over the last three years, we have had a hard save of over $241,000 okay. just in avoidance cost mm -hmm. on workers' comp insurance premiums. Mm -hmm.